And good morning, ladies and gentlemen. On this Monday, welcome to Ask the Theologian. Glad you are here. I'm Dr. Andy White, and we <coughs> are going to get it out. We're going to take your biblical, theological, and worldview questions and have a delightful time doing it. We're going to be 100% biblical. We're going to be, uh, let's, let's go... Um, Let's go, let's go get better focus. How's that? Let's go, um, uh, 78% entertaining. Let's go, uh, hand me my backpack over there, Trent. Uh, let's go, uh, 22% snarky. And I found something the other day. Um, Let's see. Oh, here we go. Still has the tag on it. Sarcasm served daily. We'll go with a little sarcasm. I was down at the tractor supply and, you know, they had all their Christmas stuff, 50%. And for some reason that was in the Christmas stuff. So, so for three bucks, I thought, hey, there we go. Sarcasm served daily. That sounds like us, doesn't it? <laughs> Glad you're here. Uh, and, uh, we'll, uh, throw that around and, uh, there we go. We've got a full week of broadcast, sort of, yeah, well, we got a full week of broadcast Monday through Friday, ask the theologian Wednesday, the gospel of Mark. Thursday, we will conclude the uh, epistle to the Romans. And then, of course, uh, go into, we already had two Sunday. We'll have two this week, depending on how you create your calendar, whether you're European or American. Uh, but um, then one, one word that you should know about is that tomorrow, for the first time ever, we have never done this before, I am going to have a guest host in Ask the Theologian. Our friend, Pastor Mark Bays, is going to be hosting. He will not be sitting behind the golden EIB microphone. He will be uh, from Oklahoma City, but on our stations, our channels, he's going to do it. I said Oklahoma City. He's in Dallas, uh, <coughs> awaiting the three babies. And uh, so, uh, so, so tune in. Give them a little encouragement tomorrow. I've got an appointment in Santa Fe at 9.30. And that was the only time we could uh, do it. So had to be out. Hated, uh, hated that. But uh, anyway, such it is. Now, what is on your mind today? You can put your questions in 24-7. By the way, if you would like a question directly from Mark, uh, I'm, I'm going to let him do, because he's still on training wheels, I'm going to let him do what I do not do. I do not read the questions in advance. And I am going to let him read the questions in advance, because he's just a boy, you know? I mean, you, 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 you can't expect a boy to be a man, okay? <laughs> so, uh, so, there we go. I'll let him read the questions. And if you have a question directly for Mark, go ahead and, and uh, ask your question. You can put it in today. Just use the word question first if you're watching live. Or you can go to askthetheologian.com and submit your questions 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And again, I'll watch it through the day and see... Uh, see that those come out uh, in that manner. So, good to, uh, good to see all of you. Uh, yeah, Rudy, I agree. Rudy says, I think you need a bigger desk. Oh, Rudy, if you could only see the rest of it. Or maybe I just need to put stuff away. It's a possibility too, but... I got more important stuff to do. 
Miguel, good to see you uh, down in the Dominican Republic. Virginia here. Uh, we've got uh, some Canadians here. It's a, it's a cold, cold day for most people. You know, I, speaking of Mark down in Dallas, I saw today, well, actually it was last night when I went to bed, I checked, and uh, Dallas is colder than my home at 8,600 feet above sea level in the Rocky Mountains. And most of you through the United States, we, it, it sort of, it sort of missed us. We're, we're, we're balmy here in Taos. Uh, sorry that you all are going through. Ah, oh, St. Stephen, New Brunswick. Good to see you. Doran, I'm glad you're with us uh, here. Thank you. And uh, Bruce in Indiana. Good to see you. Got Northern Ireland here. And uh, let's see, Davey is asking if I answered his question. I think I did that on Friday. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, yes, I answered your question on Friday, Davey. Sorry about that. Uh, go back to Friday's broadcast. When we're done here, Lexington, Kentucky, good to see you. Uh, Pastor Tim, glad you're here with us uh, today. Got Crystal Springs, Mississippi. Oh, looky there. Josh in Manning, Alberta, that's Calgary area. Near the coldest place on earth this weekend. <laughs> Since we're doing sarcasm, would you have a fight with your wife? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I got my button undone there on the sleeves, both of them. There we go. 72 degrees below zero Fahrenheit, negative 57 uh, Celsius. Wow. Don't go outside in that, in that cold. Memphis, Tennessee, good to see you there. Oh, the Buffalo National River, negative five and six inches of snow. Wow. Let's get started with your questions today. Let's go into Benjamin in uh, Michigan. I'm trying to think of the name of the town. How would you explain? people before Paul not understanding the cross as a means for being the body of Christ, but if they had prophecies of the cross and watched it happen, okay, good, good point here. I think definitively we can say that before Well, I'll just say it. Before the cross, they did not understand that the death, burial, and resurrection was... Now, you said uh, the cross being for the body of Christ. I'll even put the cross being for Israel because Israel's gospel, the kingdom gospel, is also built upon the cross. The Messiah was to come would be rejected, would die, his soul would not see decay, would live again. And they didn't see it. I guess we would have to say there are quite a few prophecies about the cross, but wouldn't you agree they are a little bit cryptic? So, for example, yesterday we were talking about David in the, in the uh, Sunday sermon for January 14th. We were talking about David going to uh, uh, Achish, the uh, king of Gath. And we tied in together Psalm 34 because Psalm 34 is a reflection of this. In Psalm 34, I didn't read it yesterday, it was in the second half, it says, He, he keepeth all his bones... Not one of them is broken. Now, that is a prophecy. We know that was quoted in uh, it, when when Pilate came and they were uh, or Pilate ordered the bones to be broken and bring. You know, are you sure he's dead? <laughs> and they uh, broke the the, uh, the the thieves' bones, but Jesus was already dead. Thus, fulfilling this prophecy, he keepeth all his bones. Not one of them is broken. 
But I would venture to say you could read Psalm 34, you could memorize Psalm 34, you could know Psalm 34 like the back of your hand. You could be the world's expert on Psalm 34 and never realize this means Messiah's bones are not going to be broken. So only after the fact are we even today able to put these prophecies together. I would venture to say, and it would be a, it would be an interesting thing. Let's just uh, let's just write this down here to go back to it. Uh, to to say. How many prophecies of Messiah, Messiah's death, burial, and resurrection are too cryptic to understand without more information? One of the things I have never done is put together all of these, let's say the prophecies about his death, his bones will not be broken, and all those other prophecies. Put them together to see if you take out the knowledge of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Would you ever get the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ? I think... You know, if we uh, if we look in uh, the Gospel of Luke, um, uh. What is it? Uh, I'll find it here in a second. In the Gospel of Luke, it very clearly says, right before the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, it says the disciples don't don't get it. They don't they don't know about it. They don't understand it. It was uh, uh, it might say hidden before their eyes. I'm not sure if uh, if that's the exact uh, wording and terminology that's used. But there's no way you can argue that they were placing their faith in the Messiah prior to it, to, to it happening. Uh, Luke 18, uh, 31, I think, is where we need to go. And uh, it says, then he took up the twelve, said unto them, Behold, we go to Jerusalem. All things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished, for he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, and shall be mocked, and spitefully entreated, and spit uh, spitted upon, and they shall scourge him, put him to death. The third day he shall rise again. Now, right there, verse 34. And they understood none of these things. Now, wouldn't, wouldn't you agree there that that is about as plain as you can get? I mean, not only does he say it's written in the prophets, but then he explains it to them step by step, and they understood none of these things. This saying was hid from them, neither knew they the things which were spoken. We, to, to, <coughs> to come to the, uh, the bottom line answer, how would you explain it? I would explain it in two ways. One, it was rather cryptic. I think we would find. Two, you could argue that there was a, a blindness that was placed upon them just like the blindness today, so that they could not see it. I mean, it does say this saying was hid from them. Now, this saying, it's, that's hard to say, even, even hid from them. You know, what exactly does that mean? Which saying? Are we talking about this that Jesus is saying? Are we talking about the sayings of the prophets? Uh, by hid from them, is it just the uh, disciples, just the 12? Is it them, everybody? A lot of questions in that. But I would put it, one, a, a blindness, wherever that blindness came from. Two, <coughs> the, the information is just not that, that clear. Thank you. Benjamin, I appreciate uh, the Hutchinson brothers. Many in San Antonio, how can this people be judged if Jesus died for all the sins of the world. And he uh, brings about uh, two scriptures, 1 John 
chapter 2, verse 2. That's a uh, familiar one. And he is the propitiation for our sins and not ours only, but also for the sins of the world. And then following uh, that, Manny gives Revelation chapter 20, verse 12. I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. The books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged out of those things which are written in the books according to the works. Now, how, how, can, how can you judge, how can any of those in Revelation chapter 20 be judged when he is the propitiation of our sins, and not, not only ours, but also all the world? I think there are two things that uh, you have to you have to put into account. Uh, maybe two or three things you have to put into account. One is these in Revelation chapter twenty verse twelve include those who come prior to Jesus being the propitiation for our sins. I know that it is common lore in theology to say that Jesus died for every sin that had ever happened, even those that had happened prior to his death, burial, and resurrection. Let's just say we could question that. There is the possibility that the sins prior, they were held under their dispensational rule. For example, Cain was not told to place his faith in Jesus Christ. Cain was told to, he, he was told that sin lieth at the door and thou must master it. Number of interpretations of that, but I think it's an interpretation for a, for a sin sacrifice that he's supposed to bring. But however you interpret it, he's told what to do. There was not really, it, was, it certainly was not by grace through faith, not of works. It was, you must master it. Certainly some faith there because you had to have faith that that was going to do the job. So could you argue, if we do, you'd be called a heretic. But we wear the badge proudly, don't we? Could you argue that Cain's sins were not nailed to the cross? Cain had an obligation himself for those sins. Sin lieth at the door, and thou must master it. That was the plan of salvation for Cain. The plan of preparation for the future judgment would probably be a better way to put that. So, in that sense, Revelation 20, verse 12, Cain can be judged because he was not in the dispensation of the cross. Now, you can also argue this a different way, and that is that the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ did propitiate for all the sins of the world. Let's even say all time. I'm much more comfortable saying from the time it happened onward, but it did propitiate. And in the dispensation of grace, he's not holding our trespasses against us. But there is nonetheless a way to receive the benefits of it. And that is you've got to place your faith in this current dispensation. You've got to place your faith in Jesus Christ. After this dispensation, you've got to live according to to, to the standards of the law as far as I can see. So, so even, even if you say, and you should say because it's scripture, even when you say he's the propitiation for the sins of the world and he can judge people according to their works. The reason you can say that is because his saving sacrifice is only an opportunity. Now, the Calvinists, they're already foaming at the mouth, if I have any Calvinist listeners, because the Calvinists believe one of their great premises is that 
what Jesus sets out to do has to be accomplished. And therefore, they do not hold to the fact that God can offer a gift out there and let whosoever will receive it because some people would not receive it, and that would cause Jesus Christ to go down in shame and ignominy, embarrassment for all of his, all of the future eternity, and this could never happen. It's a fake scenario that the Calvinists have made up. And so therefore, they say, so Jesus guaranteed that these certain ones were going to be saved, or the Godhead did it in this covenant from before the foundations of the world, in the covenant of redemption, they guaranteed it, which then, you know, they, they just moved the problem. Now the problem is he wasn't really the propitiation of the sins of the world. He was just the propitiation of the sins of those particular people whom he chose. He didn't propitiate for those he chose to damn for the rest of eternity because he hates them all for his glory. So Calvinism really has a problem. They have a bigger problem with this. Now, the Calvinists would say, ah, you put this out as an offer, sins propitiated, as an offer to receive however, whatever the avenue is to receive it, that's works, that's works. If, if anyone accepts the offer, that's works. And yet, they couldn't give an example in reality of that being the case. There are grace gifts given all the time and by individuals and people. And the Calvinist never says receiving of those grace gifts is work. So, uh, for example, let's, let's say, um, well, we had a couple in our church just had a baby, and uh, we'll take them a meal in a couple nights. And uh, we, uh, we, we, they didn't ask us to take a meal. We just said, hey, we want to bring some food by for you. And I uh, said, sure, okay, bring it by. And uh, then we take, the, take it by, and we say, you know, we're just happy to do this. Uh, congratulations. Hope this uh, helps out a little bit and all the busyness that you've got. Enjoy your meal. And uh, they, they uh, take and enjoy that meal. And we say, see, works, 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 works on their part. No, that's just stupid. They received a gift. N nowhere in life does this Calvinist theology work that if you receive a gift, that's works. It's just asinine thinking. But the reason they build that doctrine is because they have to because they can't have whosoever will. Calvinist doctrine is absolutely against whosoever will. And so anything that gives the possibility of whosoever will, they have to, they have to cut that out. Now, I, I've, I've ventured away from the question a little bit, but he's the propitiation of our sins and the sins of the world. He's going to judge people according to their works. I think can be compatible to say, hey, those of you judged, there was an opportunity, either through the law, depending on your dispensation, or even through uh, the age of conscience or the age of the promise, whatever. There was an avenue. In every dispensation, there has been an avenue to be right with God and man. You chose not to take that avenue. And it's always been a revealed avenue as well. Uh, thanks. Manny down in San Antonio. I don't know. Did the cold weather get to San Antonio? It might have. I think... Uh, Got to Dallas anyway, so maybe so. I've got to get back to Stephen and Shrewsbury about the uh, prophetic custom on the Robert Young and his preface. Sorry, I haven't read that yet. Uh, just, a, just a little note going there. Um... reading your comments. Paul says in, in Acts 26, oh, excuse me. Hi, Jim in China. Good to see you. I was thinking about you the other day. I hope you're doing well. Paul says in Acts 26 that he, uh, uh, let's see, Paul, Paul, Paul taught that Moses and the prophets what Moses and the prophet said concerning the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. I tell you what, I am going to write that 
on my note here because I don't want to miss Acts 26 in that. And I bet we could follow the cross-references of that Pauline passage in Acts 26 to, to get even some further insight. So I appreciate that uh, comment that was there. Let's go to D. Is there a simple way to refute 2 Corinthians 5, 10 through 11 as proof that Christians will be judged on works? The words point to Jews, but maybe I have it wrong. Oh, I don't think you do, but... But how could D and Randy together be wrong? Where, where you have the witness of two, it is right. <laughs> so D says, the word 2 Corinthians uh, 5, 10 through 11, this is uh, wood, hay, stubble, gold, silver, precious stones. Every man will be judged for his works. Now D and Randy say the words point to Jews. <clears throat> I would agree with that, but let's go on. I don't feel confident discussing the book because I haven't had a chance to study it through a dispensational lens. Also, Dispensational Publishing House is a fantastic resource. I joined Biblify.Worshify. I have so much to learn. Thank you for your time. Why, thank you for the kind words and for your journey in learning. Now, I have a study on First and Second Corinthians online. I want to go do it again someday. I think I would agree with what I said. I think I, I, I probably just could have said so much more. Uh, but I think also, and I don't know if I included this in our uh, Who Are the Saints series. I've done a little study. And this is probably in the Corinthians study too, but it's probably in 1 Corinthians. I've done a little study about about supporting the fact that the Corinthians were Jews. Here, I think, is one of the mistakes we make. It's a Pauline letter, therefore it's Gentiles. I have actually been to Corinth. It's a fascinating place to be. If you're ever in Greece or in the neighborhood, I definitely encourage you to go down to uh, Corinth. And it was a very Jewish Greek town. Lot, a large Jewish community was there. Uh, there, there are a few remains of the, um, uh, of the, of the Jewish synagogue there from Paul's day and the Bema seat Paul stood before. There's a, there's a, there's a, a wonderful remain of the Bema seat, even, you know, walk where Paul walked. Yeah, that's it. But even internally in the books themselves, I think there's lots of evidence that the Corinthians were Jews. So, I'm with you. The words point to Jews. There's a lot in First and Second Corinthians in which the, Paul is speaking to Jews who are believers, no doubt, and they are even grace believers. But they're also Jews living in this time in which Israel is diminishing has not diminished. Israel is going into a blindness. As far as Paul knows, I think, there's still the possibility that Israel could come out of its blindness, could wake up, that the fullness of the Gentiles would come in, even in his own lifetime, and that Israel could accept this message. Until it's impossible for Israel to accept the message, Israel can accept the message. Today it's impossible, by the way because they don't have a national means of accepting the message, religiously accepting the message, and politically they could barely do it as well. Uh, but uh, so, so Corinthians comes in this segment here. In fact, I would put it closer to this side where there's still a lot of Jewish teaching that is there. Now, is there a simple way to refute this as proof? Not really. I've got a little booklet uh, and uh, Madison, do we have any of those uh, little booklets about uh, uh, grace, uh, grace, uh, grace, um, little free grace? Well, I can't remember what I, I can't remember the name of my book. 
Uh, but she's going to go get me one and I'll show you. And I'll just make a grace offer that anyone who would like one of those can uh, send me an email, randy at randywhiteministries.org, and I will send one. Because it's really on this topic here. Do Christ, are Christians judged for works? Do we stand before the judgment seat of Christ? And I give a little simple argument that it's not us. So, D, I would be happy to send you one of those, and I'll show you uh, show and tell here in just a moment. But um, randy at randywhiteministries.org. By the way, when you do that, make sure I reply and say, yeah, I got it. Your book is on the way, whoever you are. And, uh, and those of you overseas, I'll just send you a little PDF. There it is. By grace alone, rethinking eternal rewards in Christian theology. And uh, I don't even, I don't think I have a table of contents in here, uh, but let's, let's see. No, I don't. But uh, there's um, chapter one, the standard evangelical teaching on rewards. Uh, then there's uh, chapter two, the thin biblical support for standard teaching. And then we get uh, chapter three, the overarching theological problem with the conventional doctrine. And then chapter four, the right divided approach to eternal rewards. And I think that's, uh, that's, that's it. Four little chapters and a conclusion. Uh, and, um, and my picture in the back in black and white. Free, just for the asking. Thanks, D. Appreciate that. Matthew, the Christian curmudgeon. Good to see you. It's, uh, it's been a while since we had a Matthew question here. And I appreciate, uh, appreciate that. In reference to Wednesday's, that was last week's, Wednesday's question about the resurrections mentioned in Matthew 27, 52, and 53. That's at the uh, death of Jesus Christ. Those resurrections we decided were freaky. I'm going to reveal some biblical ignorance and ask if those saints were part of the first fruits. I say part because Jesus had yet to be resurrected, and I believe that he is referred to as the first fruit, but maybe they were partakers of this event if, if it is an event and not solely a person. I'm going to stop right there and read it further in just a moment. But what a what a um, an interesting and excellent observation here. Jesus is presented as the first fruit, but these are resurrected first. Are they part of the first fruit? You could you know you can use fruit in that sense. You can in Greek as well. Uh, that uh, you know. If you got a fruit bowl, you know, a fruits bowl, the fruit bowl, it's got fruit. So the first fruit could possibly be a collective term. I don't know why I just thought of this, but uh, I should say. Here's a little English lesson for you. Why do we have... Mouse, mice, moose, mooses. Actually, just moose, I believe. Look at those moose. Why is it meese? Moose, meese. Mouse, mice. Goose, geese. Moose doesn't follow that. I'll tell you why. Because they came to us from a different language, that's why. And, and English has adopted lots of languages from the world, and we kept their, 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 their grammatical rules in that. That's why we have grammatical rules that don't always make sense. This one doesn't go with that one. What's up with that? Well, it, it came to us from a different language. So, so talking about fruit, got my... ADD mind going there. I know there's mention of first fruits, the harvest, the gleanings. There's also an agricultural application, but I also believe those terms are used in reference to resurrection passages. True. 
Is there not a type of rapture or gathering at the end of the tribulation from the four corners? Uh, oh, the, the suggestion here, could it be that those individuals were a foreshadow or a type of the rapture? I would probably say no there. I, I would have to really work hard to be convinced uh, that there's any possibility of being a type of the rapture. I think, to, to take your question, is there not a type of the rapture? I'll just stop right there and say, no, there's not a type of the rapture because the rapture is not foreshadowed. It's not traceable. It's, it's unsearchable prior to the point of Paul when it was revealed. And so I think I would disregard that as, as a type of the rapture, or at least I would say, you're going to have to explain this really well. You're going to have to have a very robust argument. And I don't know that you could other than similarities. Going on, our rapture is never referred to as a harvest by Paul, is it? I don't think so. In fact, I'm sure it's not. Perhaps believing Israel is the harvest and unbelieving Israel is the gleanings. I'm sorry, I have uh, too many questions bundled here, but any clarity you can give would, uh, uh, would be more than I know. <laughs> well, you, you, you know enough to bundle together a bunch of questions that are all at least connected. You know, 1 Corinthians 15, I think, is, is probably the place to go. I would say is the place to go to learn about resurrections. And, uh, you know, he talks about he was buried, he rose again on the third day, scene of Cephas, scene 500, scene of James, uh, last scene also of me, I would say there is on the road to Damascus, one born out of uh, due time. And he talks about his own role for uh, just a moment. And then the necessity of the resurrection, if Christ be not risen, our, our preaching is vain. Uh, but then he ties to that, if the dead rise not, then Christ is not raised. Now, what he's saying is, if there is no resurrection, then there's no resurrection. That would include Christ. So there is a resurrection. Within the Jewish community, there was a debate about, is there a resurrection or is there not a resurrection? The Sadducees versus the Pharisees which is yet another subtle piece of evidence that this is written to Jews. If Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Uh, now Christ is risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. He talked about how death came and then every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, Afterward, they that are Christ at his coming. I'm convinced this is his second coming, by the way. I don't think Paul speaks about the rapture in 1 Corinthians 15. A lot of people would argue against me on that, but I think this is about the second coming. So we've got Christ the first fruits. Let, let, me, uh, let me pull up Greek here. Let's see, that was 1 Corinthians 15, 23. So... Singular a parquet. Uh, King James says Christ the first fruits. Greek says Christ the first fruit. I I don't think I don't think there's any discrepancy there. 
mainly because of the way we use the word fruit. We, we talk, we use it both ways. Fruit is singular and fruit is plural. But we also say fruits. Each are fruits and vegetables. It'd be just as accurate to say each are fruit and vegetable. Vegetable you can't. Vegetables you gotta add the S in there. So I, I, I think uh, probably in the in the language usage of of uh, 1611, fruits brought that together. But b- because it's it's it doesn't seem to make room for other people. He is the first fruit or the first fruits, not those in 2752 to 53. So are they part of the first fruit? They seem to be something completely different. What it is they are? Save that question for Mark tomorrow. (laughs) Helen in Virginia. I'm having a difficult time asking this question. I think I'm going to interpret that as, um, how do I word it? I know, for by grace we are saved through faith. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. So I do understand that salvation is a gift and it's not anything to do with works. What are the works that Paul talks about as we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works? That's verse 10. Excellent. So, let's go to... Ephesians 2, 8, of course, is the passage that uh, we know and have already uh, quoted here. I think, I think what it is, Helen, is you must be persnickety about the pronouns. Notice, by grace ye are saved through faith. That not of yourselves... It is the gift of, of, uh, uh, of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which uh, God hath ordained, uh, hath before ordained, that we should walk in them. Now, we've got to separate the we, the ye and the we. There is the possibility that you can start out talking about ye and then, and then include, come in and include yourself in there and start going for we. So that is a possibility. I don't think that's what we have here, but that's, that's a possibility we've got to look at. But notice uh, one more thing before I have you notice. Remember that we let Scripture interpret Scripture. So we want to know not what ye and we can mean, but what did the author intend it to mean? What did he reveal it to mean? So we let Scripture interpret Scripture. Is there a place that defines ye and we in this context? What we want is one that is simple, not, ah, this could go both ways also, but hey, that's clear as day. I got it. And we want one in close proximity. The farther away it goes with a pronoun, especially the farther away it goes, the more chance there is that there's something contextual that might change that. Now look here. Wherefore, remember that ye being in times past Gentiles in the flesh who are called the uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. Okay, (laughs) here in the flesh, these were Gentiles. These were the uncircumcision. 
we at that time ye were without Christ being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. Now let's, let, let's look here. Let's uh, put this in yellow. Ye were uh, aliens from the commonwealth of Israel strangers to the uh, covenants of promise, etc., having no hope with God in the world. Now, ye Gentiles, ye not in Israel, are saved through faith, not of yourselves, it's a gift of God. But we, now, we is not perfectly defined here, but it's not the Gentiles. It's not the people outside the commonwealth of Israel. It seems that it would make pretty logical sense that this is we, Israel, ye, the Gentiles, ye, those in the dispensation of the grace of God, saved individually, are saved by grace through faith. But we, Israel, are his workmanship in Christ Jesus, unto good works, which God hath before ordained. That is, here is a group of people that has been set aside, sanctified, called to be holy before the foundations of the earth. So, I think the reason you can't put that together in your mind is because it's all grace, no works, and then you bring your works. This is where evangelicalism gets confused. I think if you rightly divide this, if you separate this out, that solves the problem. It is Israel that was before ordained to walk in these good works. And I think we could build a very, very robust argument for that. I doubt we could make much of a robust argument at all that individual believers of the body of Christ was, was created, was, was before ordained that we should walk in them. You'd have to adopt uh, all of the uh, covenant analogies, uh, covenant theology analogies in order to, to bring that out and uh, to, to work through that. Hey, I'm going to take another question or two, but uh, I just remembered today is the day of the Iowa caucus. Caucuses. You know, I, let me just say, let's talk politically a little bit. Uh, Iowa, the Iowa caucus is, uh, is interesting. It doesn't really affect all that much. I, I don't know the statistics, but I think you could go down and say, yeah, it, um, the, 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 maybe, maybe 50, 50 on the winner of the Iowa caucus, how it comes out at the, at the end of the primary. This year, for both parties, it's, it's not much of a horse race. We, we kind of know who's... Uh, well, there's, there's nothing you know in American politics that could change on a dime, but sure looks like it's Trump-Biden, regardless of what all the caucuses and primaries do. But... I was interesting because it gets a little feel for mid-America, you know, what are people thinking? It's a, it's a give and take kind of thing. It's not where you go into the booth, you close the curtain, you push the button, you walk out. It's a, it's a conversational kind of thing. It's very uh, retail politics, more, probably more so than any place in the world. Uh, so let me say that different. Any place in the United States. For in far, as far as a presidential election, if you're in Iowa, that's, that's, that, that's where you want to go if you want to meet presidential candidates because they will come to your house. They'll cook dinner for you. They will do the dishes afterwards in order to get you at the caucus to say, he's a, he's a swell, swell guy. I like that guy. I'm voting for him. Now, Predictions. I think there is a degree in which somebody who gives predictions in American politics is just not very experienced. <laughs> the experienced people know, oh, be careful there about predictions. But let me just say, I would not be surprised if, well, let's start what I would be surprised with. I would be surprised if Trump 
doesn't do very, very well. I, I think he'll be the easy front runner. So much so that if it were another person, all the prognosticators on, in the media would be saying, he's got it wrapped up, it's in the bag, these other guys just as well quit. There's, there's no race there. But because it's Trump, they're going to talk a lot more about Nikki Haley and Ron DeSantis uh, and uh, uh, Vivek uh, Ramswamy, if I said that right. Um, they're going to talk a lot more, especially, especially Nikki. Oh, they love Nikki. Because she's one of them. So if, if, if she comes in second... They will pretend like mm, this, this, this one here. This is a, this is a game changer. I'd say it's not a game changer. You know, unless unless she comes in like a point behind. But even at that, Iowa caucuses. There's there's so much dependent upon there that. It would give her some momentum, is, is all. There are 50 states. Now, here's what I, so I would be surprised if Trump doesn't do very well. I would not be surprised if Vivek does not do far, far better than any poll shows him. I wouldn't be utterly surprised if he came in second, which would be a huge message. The media would ignore it. If, if Vivek came in second, they would say, well, typically the Iowa caucuses are no indication of what is to come in the future, blah, 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 blah. And they'll talk about, uh, uh, who was the guy from up there in Wisconsin that uh, ran for president and you know, what's that? The Governor Walker? Not Walker. Walker. Scott, Scott something. You know who I'm talking about. The guy we all forgot who won the Iowa caucuses several cycles ago. They, they, they'll say, you know, it's just like that. It's an Iowa caucus. It doesn't mean anything. It's blah, blah, blah. Because they don't want Vivek and they don't want Trump. So they'll slobber over themselves. Their leg will shake if Nikki comes in and does well. But if, if anyone else comes in and does well, Iowa doesn't, doesn't really matter all that much. For my DeSantis friends, I, th- I think he's done with. I, I didn't think he should have run in the first place. I thought it was a political mistake. I don't, I don't think he gets much out of Iowa. I think by South Carolina, he probably drops out. There's my political prognosticating for tonight. Well, Scott Walker. Scott, Scott Walker. Was he the governor? I thought he was a, like a congressman or something. He was a governor for uh, the 45th governor of Wisconsin from 2011 to 2019. Um, let's go on to another, another question. I was asking a question and it's really slow answering. Let's go to Rodney in snowy Memphis. Must not be able to work today, Rodney. Uh, glad, uh, glad you're here with us from Memphis, Tennessee, I believe in right division and can say from experience that the silence of God is probably true. Based on this, why would God in this dispensation of grace throw the body of Christ to the wolf when we don't have the power to defeat him? Our only promises seem to be after death and we really don't even know what those are. That is an honest question. 
And uh, I think uh, I think uh, it's a hard hitting question, but I think insightful. Now, there are some that would deny the premise of your question. Even some right dividers would deny the uh, premise of the question. You would, you would get, those who would say, oh, no, 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 Rodney, we just are filled with promises and strength and we gather together. But then they would go into doing a whole bunch of stuff that's not our dispensation. They'd say, oh, Rodney, don't you know that wherever two or three are gathered together and whatever you ask in my name and I will not leave you nor forsake you and all those other uh, promises, but none of them would be from the age of grace. In the age of grace, I, I probably would say, you know, the promises we have are the promise of salvation. And then faith, hope, charity. That's what we've got. Faith, hope, charity. These three. We, we don't have any more all the gifts of speaking in tongues and prophecies and all those the kind of things that are mentioned in 1 Corinthians. So, are we thrown to the wolf? Obviously, speaking of the devil. When we don't have the power to defeat him. <coughs> well, actually, let me back up one more. Our, our only promises, promises seem to be after death, and we really don't know what those are. And there's a lot of truth to that. We... How many times do I say, now we see through a glass darkly? That's a way of saying, hey, we got some promise out there, but I don't know what it is. How, how many times have I answered the question about what's our role in the coming kingdom? And my answer is, I don't know. We'll be there. <laughs> we'll be with him. But beyond that, I can't really tell you. I don't know if we're in the choir. I don't know if we play violins. I don't know if we sweep up. I don't know what we do. So there's, there's some hard-hitting truth there. Now, the one area I would disagree with your premise, and then let me try to, to, to uh, add a couple of things there. The one area in which I would agree with your premise is that we're thrown to the wolf and don't have power to defeat him. I would, first of all, use 2 Timothy 3.16, all scriptures inspired by God, profitable for correction, teaching, training, and righteousness. Pardon the paraphrase there. That the man of God may be perfect, equipped for every good work, so in the Word of God, in the knowledge of the Word of God, in the wisdom that comes from the Word of God, we've got what it takes for every good work. Now, I believe that in the silence of God, we also have the silence of Satan. I have not seen this written about much or talked about much. Of course, you know, it's a very small niche that even talks about the silence of God. But even in Sir Robert Anderson's book on the silence of God, I don't recall anything there about the silence of Satan. We almost tend to say, well, there's a silence of God, but Satan is running loose. And, and we'll quote passages from Peter, for example. You know, he's like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, which would leave us hopeless. But I really think that we could build an argument to say there is a silence of Satan as well. That is to say that there was, I don't, I don't know that this is the best analogy, but I'll go ahead and do it. There was a ceasefire that was declared. Both sides are under the ceasefire. And therefore... you can let things grow that have already been planted, but you cannot plant more. Now, there was plenty planted both in the word of God and in the work of the devil that bears fruit today and appears to be like the work of the devil. 
So, for example, I don't know, you take, uh, you take uh, abortion. Boy, Satan is working hard, isn't he, to, to, to uh, bring about a culture of death. Well, I would say, I, let, let me, uh, we've been blunt, let's just be blunt. What makes you think Satan's working? Why does Satan need to, to work when he's got Democrats? They will take up evil agendas, be happy to. He doesn't need to dirty his hands in that kind of stuff. So mankind himself, itself, has the depravity, I don't hold the total depravity, but he, he's got the depravity to carry out any and all wicked deeds here on earth. But mankind also has the ability, just like Cain, you know, sin life at the door and thou must master it. Mankind has the ability to do that. Down through history, sometimes mankind collectively has chosen, uh, uh, you know, better paths than at other times. Our power to defeat it is in understanding the Word of God, proclaiming the Word of God, teaching the Word of God, living the Word of God, doing good stuff instead of bad stuff. So then there is that power to defeat because it's not the spiritual, direct spiritual work of the devil. It's rather seeds that he planted. Nice thing about that is you can come hack them seeds down as soon as they begin to grow, those seedlings, and get rid of them. Now, we haven't always done a great job doing that. Certainly haven't the last couple of generations. Excellent uh, question. Rodney, thank you. And... Um, Got uh, a number of uh, questions. Uh, oh, Davey, thanks. Uh, Trent gave me the number. Uh, question 5,380 on Ask the Theologian, your, your question from last week. Uh, askthetheologian.com, then just uh, do a little search or slide down to 5,380. Do you know we've asked more than 5,380 questions? Because that's just the ones that you put here officially, and that's just the ones since we started that program. So we've got thousands and thousands of questions out there. You could listen all day long. Okay, it is past time for me to go. Good to see all of you uh, here uh, today, <laughs> and uh, a blessing. Uh, remember... Uh, <laughs> Randy says, I hope I can dance like Gene Kelly. I have no rhythm for dancing here. He's speaking of promises in the future. There's, there's the possibility, Randy, that you'll be a, maybe we'll all be Gene Kelly kind of dancers in that. Now, now I start reading. Linda says, I thought DeSantis had said when he was running for re-election as governor that he would not campaign for president. He did say that. I think while he was planning to run for president, I think that was one of his biggest errors. Now, sometimes circumstances change, and I, I, I understand politicians might come say, okay, I'm, I said this, but I changed my mind. But at least you got to own it. What changed? What was the difference? I don't, as far as I know, he's never, never owned that. He's, he has Plate, as y'all mentioned, the the uh, the politician. I I probably will make a few of you mad here. I think. Of the four people still in the Republican race that I know about, which is Trump, Nikki Haley, Ron DeSantis, and Vivek, I think, I think Ron DeSantis, 
though I appreciate what he's done in Florida, is the most sleazy politician of them all. If he's not that, he's done a bad job presenting himself. And that's part of it right there is I'm not going to run for president. Thank you for electing me. Now I'm going to run for president. That's sleazy politician stuff. And I, I, if, if you're going to have a sleazy politician, which maybe they all are, I, I want one who's going to be sleazy towards conservative issues and take what you can get. Uh, so I would certainly rather have that than I, I'll, I'll take Ron DeSantis any day of the week over Joe Biden. But not really my favorite politician. Okay, that's enough. Enough politics for today and enough religion for today. Remember, tomorrow I will be out, but we will be broadcasting. Our friend Pastor Mark Bays will be... Uh, uh, in hosting from Dallas. Now, y'all be kind and gentle to him. It's his first time. He doesn't have all the equipment that we have, but he's a smart boy with a few good things to say. I, th- I think it'll be interesting. Um, and I'll probably tune in a little bit because uh, I'll, I'll be sitting in a uh, auto waiting room um, for a car recall. Might just tune in. Maybe I'll submit my own questions. How would that be? I should have brought it. Randy, we got one of them fruitcakes from your town. still have it. <laughs> but you know, it makes a nice tin. <laughs> Is that why people buy fruitcakes? Just for the tin, right? Just throw that thing out. Look, we got a nice tin here <laughs> from Corsicana. Okay. I got to quit. I'm 10 minutes late. Thanks everybody for being here uh, with us today. Uh, I'll see you Wednesday. We'll see you tomorrow, 10 a.m. Mountain Time. It's been a blessing to have each one of you. God bless. Take care.